If you have your Bibles, open them up to Philippians chapter 2. Philippians chapter 2, we're going to be finishing out uh, verses 19 through 30 as we make our way through the book of Philippians. Um, as I was putting together this message, Paul is kind of giving us an example of everything he's been saying up until this point. So the end of chapter 2 and all of chapter 3 are three illustrations for the things that he has been preaching and encouraging the Philippians to do. And I don't know about you, but I, I think most of us find that having a uh, person or an example to look to, to, to have a model, is very helpful in our lives. For, for myself, I was thinking about this as I was preparing this week, and I remember uh, being uh, younger. I wasn't necessarily young, but I was younger, and um, feeling as though God wanted me to be in ministry. But understanding and reading the Bible, um, that calling that people so often talk about um, in a biblical context, if you read your Bible, is a calling from the church. So in other words, the church identifies and says, we see in you a potential to be a gospel minister. We see in the way that you serve and care for people uh, an, an opportunity that we think can be encouraged and that little spark can be fanned into a flame, right? It's not just I woke up one morning and thought, hey, this is what I'm going to do with my life, right? It, it has to be something confirmed by the local church. And so believing that, I went to my pastor. I'd been serving in lay ministry in our church, doing college work and uh, different ministry that way. And and I, I told him, I said, I feel like the Lord may be calling to me to something more. I don't know what that is, but I feel like there's something more that he wants me to do. And because of my job, I'm a consultant at the time, I'm very flexible with my schedule. So I can pick the days that I work to make money to support my family. So I'm not asking to be on the payroll. I'm not asking for a job, but I just, I feel like there's something more that God wants for me. Um, unfortunately, the pastor that was at the church at the time, um, looking back, I understand now, uh, maybe felt a little threatened by that and, and said, no, no, there's nothing, there's nothing we need. Right now. I'm going to tell you as a pastor, you come to me and you tell me you give me two days a week. <laughs> I don't feel threatened by that at all. We're going to, we're going to put you to work. Right. But, but for him, it was like, ah, you know, I, I don't know. And so, um, so I was really confused. I was like, okay, God, I, I thought this was the next step and what you wanted me to do. And maybe this isn't, maybe, you know, maybe I'm wrong. And, and then I get a call, um, from the pastor about two weeks later. And he's like, Hey, there's a, there's a ministry opportunity I just heard about. And I think you might be a good fit for it. So, um, go talk to this guy named Hugh. So um, I went and talked to Hugh Dampier, and he worked for our local Baptist association. So he was kind of over, uh, really under, I should say, 30 churches. So he served 30 different churches um, doing missionary work, uh, helping mobilize people to go and do projects. And so if one church was struggling, he would get people from other churches to go help them. And uh, he would do pulpit supply, fill in, that kind of stuff. And I, I'd never met him before, but I showed up on his doorstep and I said, hey, this is what I feel like the Lord's doing. And again, I'm not asking for money. I'm not asking for a job. I just, I feel like this is where I need to go. And he was like, let's go. And so he spent about a year with me, just mentoring me and, and meeting with me. And we would go and do things. He would just take me along. He would just say, come, come hop in the truck. We're going to do some visits and we're going to talk to some people. Um, eventually it did turn into a job. They kind of saw a need for uh, what I was doing. And that was one of my first official ministry jobs in full-time ministry was with him. And, uh, he was a little older than I am. He would say he was much older than I am. Um, but it, it was kind of fun. We would go around and he would tell everybody that he was old and senile and I was young and dumb. And that was, that was our little stick that we had with each other, right? And, and we got to do so much ministry together, and he taught me so much. He, he was 
I, I, when I say the exact opposite of me, I can't stress how much he is the exact opposite of me. Military, punctual, got a time, <laughs> early. I'm more sliding in a little late, but I'll work late. You know, he was ready to go at five and I'm, I'm you know, ready to keep going. And, and so we, we kind of counterbalanced each other. And I didn't realize it till much later. He, he took me to lunch and, and was like, hey, you know, I just want you to know how much I appreciated that season of my ministry. And I'm telling him, no, I, I appreciated, you know, all that you were doing for me. You poured into me. You, you gave me a chance when nobody else would give me a chance. You opened up doors and gave me opportunities. And, and it was just, looking back, I, so much of what I do and why I do it was shaped by watching him do it. Now, it, he, he was going to the Word, and he was digging into the Word and figuring out, okay, this is, this is the way we need to go. But the example was so helpful to me to see someone actually doing it, right? You, you read about this stuff. You read about, you know, praying and, and fasting for people and doing all this stuff. But there's something about having an example, like something that you can physically see, someone you can go and ask, how do we do this? What, what does that look like? And, and a lot of the ways that Church on the Way has been designed and developed is to try to give people those kind of opportunities. We, we meet in small groups every week in hopes that the older people in the small group will help teach the younger people in the small group. I don't know if you know, if you've read your New Testament, that's the biblical model for discipleship, right? Now, not all the older people who are in your group have it all together. And sometimes they need to learn from the younger people. But, but again, that, that's what God does when we have some examples of what it looks like to be a follower of Jesus. And Paul knew that better than anybody else. So he's, he's challenged. I, I know I've heard from some of you that the sermons have been challenging. I want to remind you the text has been challenging because Paul was challenging this church in Philippi. And he knows what they need now is some examples. They, all of this theology, all of these words need to come down into some kind of concrete form. Something they can look to and ask questions of. And so Paul's going to do that. And so over the next really two weeks or more, we're going to look at these three examples that he gives us. And, and I'm going to kind of handle this text a little differently. I want to kind of look at both of these friends together and kind of lump, you know, what Paul is saying about both of them. So let me, let me read our text to you real quick about Timothy and Epaphroditus, and then we will jump in. Starting in verse 19, he says, I hope in the Lord Jesus to send Timothy to you soon so that I too may be cheered by the news of you. For I have no one like him who will be genuinely concerned for your welfare. For they all seek their own interests, not those of Jesus Christ. But you know Timothy's proven worth. How as a son with a father, he has served me in the gospel. I hope therefore to send him just as soon as I see how it will go with me. And I trust in the Lord that shortly I myself will, will come also. I have thought it necessary to send to you Epaphroditus, my brother and fellow worker and fellow soldier and your messenger and minister to my need. For he has been longing for you all and has been distressed because you heard that he was ill. Indeed, he was ill, near to death, but God had mercy on him, and not only on him, but on me also, lest I should have sorrow upon sorrow. I am the more eager to send him, therefore, that you may rejoice at seeing him again, and that I may be less anxious. So receive him in the Lord with all joy, and honor such men. For he nearly died for the work of Christ, risking his life to complete what was lacking in your service to me. Amen. So the, the big idea I want you guys to see is, is when you have godly friends, the, Paul has these two men that he just, he sees as close companions and friends in the gospel. And, and that is revealed 
by their character. It's revealed in the fact that they're willing to risk everything for Christ. And I want to kind of look at that this morning of of how these two men, and I, I want to pull our text, but also give you some other texts to help fill in the picture here. One of the things that you, you see about a godly friend is they demonstrate their worth. Now, there are some people who, I'm going to use the term, act godly. But they don't demonstrate godliness. Right? These are people who like to study and have all the right answers, but want to sit in an office by themselves all day long and just think about the right answer. They're not demonstrating what a gospel-centered life should look like. And so let me give you some, some ways in which you can kind of differentiate between someone who just tries to have all the right answers and someone who's actually demonstrating what it means to be a godly friend. Godly friends first demonstrate their genuine concern for others. We see this as in verses 19 and 20. The the apostle Paul was a, a man whose focus was on the Lord Jesus, right? He's he's laser focused into serving Jesus. In two nineteen he says, "But I hope in the Lord Jesus to send Timothy to you shortly." And in two twenty four he says, "I trust in the Lord that I myself also shall be coming shortly." It's Paul's way of saying, "If it be the Lord's will, right? If if the Lord wills it, this is what I want to do." It shows that he did not make a decision based simply on what he thought was best. He wasn't just thinking about himself and and what his own knowledge. He was, at the end of the day, entrusting whatever was going to happen next with with the will of God. He, He submitted everything to the Lord and his will. And when he mentions how Epaphrodites got well from the illness, he doesn't say, oh my goodness, thank Thank goodness he took some medicine and he got better. But rather God had mercy on him. And not on him only, but also on me. Right? Unless my sorrows be multiplied. I'm I'm in prison and losing one of my best companions. And Timothy's focus likewise was also on the Lord. Paul states that unlike many others, Timothy was not seeking after his own interests. Instead, his focus was on Jesus and the gospel. Timothy served with Paul in the furtherance of the gospel. We see that in 22. Christ and the gospel were at the center of Timothy's life, just like they were at the center of Paul's life. Epaphrodites also was a faithful servant whose focus was on the things of Christ. He had pushed himself almost to the point of death to bring the gift to, uh, to bring a gift to Paul from the Philippian church, right? And, and we don't know all the details. We're not given the details of what that looked like. If it was the, the journey over that wore him out, or if he did get some kind of sickness once he got to Rome. But either way, he was giving his all to fulfill the mission from the Philippian church to Paul, right? To, to, to care for Paul, to, to demonstrate the love that he had for Paul, his longing and concern for the church back in Philippi also reveal his servant's heart for the things of Christ. Paul calls Epaphrodites a, a minister to my need and states that he had, complete, had completed by his presence what the Philippians could not do in their absence in service to Paul. Right? The, the Philippian church wanted to help Paul, but they were in another city. There was only so much they could do. So they raised money. They get together a gift for Paul and then send Epaphrodites as a missionary to Paul as a representative, as an extension of the Philippian church, right? So whenever we send someone down to Guatemala or the Bahamas, we're doing the same thing. We're gathering up some of our resources and we're sending an extension of church on the way to another county, another city, another country for the sake of the gospel, And we see the church in Philippi doing that here for Paul. And this word that is translated minister in our text here 
And, and service, it comes from the Greek word that we get our word liturgy from. Right? We, we do a, a liturgy here on Sunday mornings. But in the secular Greek, that word was used of a man who, out of love for his city, would render service in the public sphere. Right? He, he's coming to serve, and over time it has come to have this meaning of, of sacred service or worship. But, but at its Greek roots, it, it's just a man out of the love that he has for his city or people that, that he's willing to serve. And every servant of Jesus Christ does what he does, whether giving or helping or speaking as an offering to the Lord Jesus Christ himself. A servant's heart is at the center, is centered on our Lord Jesus and his work. This focus on Christ and his work should not just be true of those of us who earn our living from the gospel. Every Christian should be should live every day in fellowship with the Lord and in submission to his will, available to do his work, wherever that may be, with whomever that may be. Christian service will be ready to tell lost people about their Savior and about his work on the cross, dying for them. They're watching, they're, they're looking for opportunities to please God by serving others, not to please others by serving them, right? Their their goal isn't to try to be people pleasers. Their goal is to please God by serving others. We see three attitudes that kind of mark servants who are focused on the Lord Jesus Christ in in our text this morning. First, they're willing to be sent anywhere. They're willing to be sent anywhere. It wouldn't have been easy for Timothy to leave the side of his beloved father in the faith in order to go to Philippi. But he was willing to go if that was God's will. It hadn't been easy for Epaphroditus to leave the comforts of his home and journey to Rome. But he had done it. Now it would also be difficult for him to leave Paul and return home, but he was willing to go if that's what the Lord wanted. Have you told the Lord, I'm willing to go anywhere you want me to go? I'm willing to go anywhere you want me to go. I remember um, (laughs) being a kid in youth group, and and I I, I felt that calling into ministry really early in my life, and, and I ran and ignored it for a long time. And I remember one of the reasons why, and it's, it's so, it's, it's funny how God works. But one of the reasons why was I was afraid he was going to send me to Africa. And I was going to be living in a hut, right? Probably get killed by spear, you know? Like, that, that's, that's what was, in, like, I was like, God, I'll, I'll, I'll do anything, but, you know, but not that, Right? It's like, can I have a few caveats on what I will do? And then I remember the Lord, after being, you know, going into ministry, uh, the Lord gave me the opportunity to go and teach twice in Africa. And I want to tell you what, it was the best time of my life. Two of the best trips I've ever had preaching and teaching the gospel. There is something about it when you get to church and I don't think many of you would define where I was at as church. We would call it a pole barn. And there's all kinds of wonderful aromas around. And, and you look over in the distance and you see this guy walking up with a keyboard. And I'm looking around going, okay, this is a pole barn. There are no outlets. <laughs> there are no lights. <laughs> there's no sound. What, what's he going to do with this keyboard? And then another guy, he's walking up with a car battery. And they hotwire the the piano into the battery, and they start having worship. And I'm talking to the people afterwards, and they had walked 45 minutes to an hour to come hear the gospel preached. And I'm in America going, I can't even get people to get in their car and drive 10 minutes to come hear the gospel preached. 
And this pole barn is packed out of people. And I realized in that moment, God, I'm stupid. I'm stupid. This is the thing. The thing I'm afraid of is bringing me the most joy. Have you told God, I'm willing to go wherever you want me to go? Is there anywhere this morning that you're not willing to go for the Lord? And listen, it doesn't have to be Africa. I know for some of you, the scariest place for you to go and share the gospel is family dinner at Thanksgiving. Where is it that you're not willing to go for the Lord? This morning, one easy, just here, here's a very easy, practical, concrete step for you. If you say, yes, I'm willing to go wherever the Lord wants to send me, get a passport. Take the step and get a passport. Even though I don't have a trip plan. But you can't go if you don't have a passport. And so many people have had opportunities. Oh, but I don't have my passport. If you're willing to go wherever God wants to send you, spend a little bit of money, save up a little bit of money if you have to, and get a passport and be ready to go. Second, not only are they ready and willing to be sent anywhere, but they're willing to serve anyone. Timothy served Paul, but he was willing to go and serve the Philippian church if that's what God willed. Epaphroditus was, served the Philippian church, but he was willing to go and serve Paul. And this reminds me of Philip who, who, had been, uh, who was being used by God to reach multitudes of people in Samaria, but he was willing to go to a deserted road where the Lord used him to reach an Ethiopian eunuch. A servant of Christ isn't out to make a name for himself by, by speaking to large crowds. He, he's available to his Lord to serve anyone that the Lord directs him to serve. This morning, is there anyone you're not willing to serve? Are there places you're not willing to go and people you're not willing to serve? God wants us to be these kinds of gospel-centered friends that are willing to take the risk for him. Third, are you willing, they're, they're willing to sacrifice anything. Timothy had given up his own interest to become a servant of Christ. Epaphrodites almost lost his life in the service for the Lord. To the Ephesian elder, Paul said of his own ministry, I do not consider my life in Acts 20, 24. I do not consider my life of any account as dear to myself in order that I may finish my course in the ministry which I received from the Lord Jesus to testify solemnly of the gospel of the grace of God. Have you told the Lord, I will give up everything, my desires, my ambitions, my comfort, my money to serve you? Now this morning I've, I've emphasized this point at, at length that a, a servant's heart is, is centered on the things of Jesus. Because if you have any other motive or any other reason for Christian service, you will eventually burn out. I, I've been doing full-time ministry now for 25 years. And I can't tell you how many of my friends who started with me or started after me are no longer doing it. It's hard. But it's impossible if your focus isn't on pleasing and serving him. If it's on any other reason, if your hope is coming from any other source, you will burn out. You'll get angry. You'll be hurt. Amber was telling me the other day, she goes, man, I, you know, she, she was working and helping with somebody. And, and she goes, I just, I feel, I feel like I'm getting used. And I told her, I said, look, if you're doing ministry and you don't feel like sometimes, not all the time, but sometimes you're getting used, you're not doing ministry. You're doing what you want to do and only what you want to do. 
Because when you do ministry, you are going to get used. Now, again, I don't want to enable people and I don't want to make it a habit, but it is just a reality that some people are going to use you. And if your focus isn't on serving Jesus and pleasing him, you are going to get angry and bitter and upset and eventually burn out because of the way people treat you. You'll grow weary of the hardships you have to endure. And sadly, so many people just quit in disgust and think, I don't want anything to do with the church. I'm going to go out and start my own church in my house with the people I like. And then it gets a little bit bigger. And then you're like, I don't like some of these people. So I'm going to go buy a new house and move so they don't know where I'm at. And then I'll start a new house church. Because that's easier for me. I can control that. I don't get used as much. Serving people is hard. You're going to have to sacrifice a lot. And that's why a servant's heart must constantly be captivated with Christ. If not, you're going to burn out. If you're serving for any other reason than the love of the Lord Jesus, who gave himself for your sins, you are not going to make it. So that's three things. They're they're willing to be sent anywhere. They're willing to serve anyone. And they're willing to sacrifice everything. But second in our passage this morning, God's friends or godly friends risk their lives for the work of Christ. Remember, the apostle Paul was in prison as he's writing this letter facing a possible execution. That was a legitimate outcome of his trial. And Timothy was his right-hand man and and faithful man who had served with Paul as a child serving his his father in verse 22, it says. And it it would have been understandable if Paul, thinking of the circumstances, had said, look, I can't spare Timothy right now. He's got to stay here with me. But instead, he was willing to send Timothy for the sake of the Philippian church. The Philippians had been willing to serve Paul by giving monetarily and by sending Epaphroditus who himself had been willing to serve right up until the brink of death on Paul's behalf. And of Timothy, Paul says, for I have no one like him who will be genuinely concerned for your welfare. For they all seek their own interests, not those of Jesus Christ. Now, these are somewhat hard words for us to understand because You would think out of all the faithful Christians in Rome, he could have found someone else who wasn't living for themselves. I mean, you got Luke, you got Titus, Epaphroditus. But Paul must have meant that that those available to him at that time as messengers, that Timothy was the only one he knew of who would genuinely seek after their interests over his own. In other words, Timothy would put their needs, the needs of others, over himself. This morning, are you the kind of person that will put others' needs ahead of yourself? Let me me give you a couple ways I think we see in the passage to know if we're doing that this morning. First, you'll have a heartfelt love. Like When you read this passage, these, these, these verses are just overflowing with Paul's heartfelt love for Timothy, Epaphroditus, and for the Philippians. Notice how Epaphroditus longed for the Philippians and was distressed because they heard that he was sick in verse 26. The term distressed is also used to describe Jesus' anguish in the garden, the same word. Now, some super spiritual Christians try to remove all emotion from the Christian life, believing that Spiritual maturity means being stoic without having any emotion, not showing grief or anxiety, tenderness, tears, none of that. I just got to be, you know, put together all the time. But Paul explains that if, if Epaphroditus had died, he would have been overwhelmed with grief. 
at the loss of his dear friend. Right? My sorrows would have been multiplied. Paul, who wrote Romans 8, 28, and understood Philippians 4, 6 through 7, about not being anxious, did not rebuke Epaphroditus for being distressed over the Philippian church. Paul was not afraid to be human and express deep feelings for others. One of the ways we know that we're able to put others above ourselves is that we have a heartfelt love for people. Second, you'll show genuine concern. This passage is filled with heartfelt love, but my my focus here is on Timothy's genuine concern for the people. He, He was not seeking his own interest, but was dedicated to the welfare of the church, it says. Unfortunately, many that serve the Lord, including some of us in full-time ministry, we do it with, with mixed emotions. So, so many times we seek the praise of others, maybe even enjoying being in the spotlight. And I'm sure you've all met people like that over the years. They don't show a genuine concern for the people that God has given them to care for. Third, and and finally, you you can work cooperatively with others. Timothy served with Paul like a child, his father. Paul and Epaphroditus worked together harmoniously in the gospel to, to advance the cause of the gospel. To do that, you've got to die to yourself and your opinions about how everything should be done. And put others ahead of yourself for the sake of the work. And there's some people who just aren't team players unless, unless they are the boss or unless things are exactly done the way they want it being done. Even though Paul was clearly the leader among these men, he was about 25 years older than Timothy. We don't know about Epaphroditus, but he never lorded it over them. He humbly calls Epaphroditus his brother, his fellow worker, his fellow soldier. And he deflects any glory for himself and he lifts up these two faithful servants. Right? He gives three examples and he uses these two first. He doesn't use himself and then say, oh, by the way, here, let me, let me tell you about these other two guys. They're not too bad either. No, he starts with them. He gives them the preference. And then he moves to himself. We, we need to cultivate a servant's heart centered on the things of Jesus, putting others ahead of ourselves for the sake of the gospel. And this is hard to do. So many times we, we are, are so focused on trying to be right and having our opinion being executed that we just run over other people. We're not even aware of the damage that we're causing because we're so, we, we just have such a tunnel vision that we can't see the bigger picture. We can't see the collateral damage that is happening. If we're going to faithfully serve others over ourselves, we're going to have to open up our vision and begin to see the effect that it's having on other people. The final thing I want you to see this morning from this passage is when you find friends like this, friends in the gospel, celebrate them. Godly friends deserve joyful honor for their service to Christ. You have people in your small group who are faithfully showing up, faithfully opening up their house, faithfully serving you. Celebrate them. Give them the honor that they deserve for being faithful to their Lord. It's not about being faithful to you. They're being faithful to God. Left to ourselves, we remain self-centered, but the but with the Spirit of God, we... He he is at work to transform us into the image of Christ, the suffering servant. And and as a result, we serve not merely when it's convenient or it costs us nothing. We serve even when it costs us dearly. Perhaps we may not be called to risk our physical safety to serve others in the name of Jesus. But Jesus says to all of his followers in Mark 8, 34 through 35, if anyone would come after me, Let him deny himself and take up his cross and follow me. 
For whoever would save his life will lose it. But whoever loses his life for my sake and the gospels will save it. After all, even the Son of Man came not to be served, but to give his life for a ransom for many. He came to serve. Why should we as followers adopt any other mindset than that of Christ? It's not about come serve me. It's about how can I be a servant? When we find these godly friends, the way Paul has found these godly friends, we should celebrate them. We we should celebrate the fact that God has given them. We should thank God for them. Because so many people, as Paul says, are just after their own interests. And when you find a few that aren't, praise God. May we be those kinds of people this morning. May we be that kind of church this morning. That's our challenge that Paul is giving to us in this short little section on Timothy and Epaphroditus. That we would follow their example of faithfully being willing to go anywhere he asks us to go, do anything he asks us to do, and serve anyone he asks us to serve. Let's pray. Father, we know that is only possible through the transforming power of the Holy Spirit in our heart. And so, Father, first I pray this morning, if anyone is here and they do not know you, that they would put their faith and trust in you. Because it is then and only then can the Holy Spirit begin to change our selfish heart into one that's able to serve others. And Lord, all of us are here this morning who have put our faith and trust in you and we are on a process of discipleship and sanctification and learning how to do this better. God, may you send men and women into our lives to be models like Timothy and Epaphroditus. And Lord, may we, with the little that we have, turn around and be models to those who are younger in the faith than us. It's not our job to fill up Their cup, Lord, it's just our job to empty out what's in our cup that has been so graciously given to us. As we come now and celebrate communion, we we, we take this cup that, that was filled by Jesus. He is the cup filler, Lord, the ultimate cup filler. And as we take the bread that represents his body, and we dip it into the wine that represents his blood that was shed for us. Lord, we are celebrating this morning our, our freedom from sin, our freedom from bondage, our, our freedom from selfishness, Lord. That, that we now this morning have the ability to be different, to, to be like Timothy and Epaphroditus and Paul. Lord, may we come this morning to the table remembering all that you have done for us and all that you continue to do for us as you patiently and faithfully love us. Help us to love others the way you love us. 